Americans, we love ice cream. Each person eats about 24 quarts of it per year. And that's for one big reason. It tastes amazing. But someone had to teach Ben and Jerry's how to do it. Turns out, that guy, he works at Penn State. This is Dr. Bob Robert, hold on. Okay, this is Dr. Bob Roberts. He teaches ice cream courses at Penn State. I do. I have two courses, ice cream short course and ice cream 101. Side note, these are the type of books ice cream professors read. Okay, back to the story. Part of the reason that ice cream is so good in the U.S. is that we've been teaching ice cream for 125 years. And Bob, he's been teaching at Penn State for 25 of those. And he's had some pretty famous students. Companies like Unilever, Nestle, Breyers, Ben & Jerry's, um, you name the company, they've sent people here. That's because the Penn State Creamery is on the forefront of ice cream technology. Ice cream is a formulated food. There is no naturally occurring ice cream. You have to put the ingredients together and process it to make ice cream. Bob and his department, they spend their time figuring out how to make ice cream even better. When we look at, at studying ice cream, we study ice cream from cow to the cone. So we look at what happens on the farm, what happens with the milk. Wait, there's a farm? We have a, a herd of about 250 or so milking Holsteins, and yes, they are on campus. So yeah, he knows ice cream, but he says that he's not an ice cream purist. I'm not sure what an ice cream purist is, but I wouldn't eat frozen yogurt if I had the opportunity to eat ice cream. <laughs> yeah, well, that does make sense considering he is the authority on ice cream. Bob, what's your favorite flavor? Hmm, dulce de leche. Ooh, yeah. Cakes, cookies, and brownies. No, we're not going to show you how to make them because they can be made with ease thanks to Betty Crocker, who was born in 1921 in Minnesota. Well, kind of. In 1921, the Washburn Crosby Company, now known as General Mills, ran a contest for people to complete a puzzle for the most coveted prize, a pin cushion. Yes, one of your very own. Surprisingly, a lot of people wrote in to claim their prize, but with a little P.S. How do I make my sponges? How much How long? How much flour should I use? They wanted baking advice. So the customer service department began to reply, and to make their tips seem more genuine, they signed their letters Betty Crocker. Betty, because it was a cheery, all-around, American-sounding name, and Crocker after a board member. Not being a real person didn't stop Betty Crocker from having a very successful radio show, the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air, with a different accent in every state. Welcome to the Betty Crocker, Welcome to the Betty Crocker, 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 Crocker Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air. But the lies don't stop there. Let's talk about that added ingredient, the egg. You don't need to add a fresh egg to powdered cake mix, but science says it makes us feel like we aren't cheating and we're better providers. So thanks, Betty Crocker, for making us all feel like we know how to bake. Popcorn, movies, a match made in theater heaven. But there was a time when this was banned. Popcorn has been around for over 8,000 years. But when it hit American streets in the mid-1800s, it took off. It was cheap and could be mass-produced on the go. Not to mention, it smelled amazing. It was the go-to snack at circuses, sporting events, and fairs. In fact, the only place you wouldn't find popcorn was at the movies. You see, going to the movies used to be a major event. The only people that went were fancy rich folks because you had to be educated enough to read. Fancy, like there was even a coat check. But there was definitely no concession stand. There was, however, popcorn street vendors who set up shop outside theaters. They made a killing selling to waiting theater goers. Theater goers that started smuggling their pop treats inside. Not cool. 
Early movie theaters kindly asked patrons check their popcorn before entering. Then, in 1927, films started adding sound, meaning everyone went to the movies. The Great Depression followed, making movies a cheap escape. Huge crowds plus crunch muffling sound equaled another revenue opportunity for theater owners. By 1945, over half the popcorn consumed in America was being eaten at the movies. A marriage that has continued ever since. To get ourselves a treat. Cotton candy. Who knew sugar and air could taste so sweet? Well, a guy named James Morrison, an amateur inventor whose occupation and taste buds didn't exactly align. He was a dentist. And during his lifetime, James even became the president of the Tennessee Dental Association. Don't forget to floss. But he was also a confectionery enthusiast with a passion for culinary advancement. He paired with John C. Wharton, an old friend and fellow confectioner. Together, the two designed and co-patented what they called the electronic candy machine. The device rapidly spun and melted sugar through small holes until it was fluffy and nearly 70% air. They called the new treat Fairy Floss. They introduced their product at the 1904 World's Fair selling it in small wooden boxes for 25 cents each. Thank you. That's about six dollars today. Fairy Floss was a huge success. In six months, they sold over 68,000 boxes, grossing in today's money around $440,000. But despite the success of the sugar spun business, Morrison returned to his day job as a dentist. So next time the dentist tells you you're eating too many sugary treats, well, Blame him. Awkward. Everybody loves ice cream. Even those who say they don't like ice cream still love ice cream. We use ice cream as a way to support our community. Michael Mikey Cole and I own Mikey Lakes and Ice Cream. I did not always sell ice cream. I was born in the Lower East Side of New York City, East Village, two blocks from the shop. I was selling drugs at one point. I ended up getting caught. I ended up going to jail for six months. A few years ago, my mother got sick. I promised to her that I wouldn't be locked up anymore or do the wrong things. Ice cream was something that just came into my life at a time when I didn't really know what I was kind of doing. This is pop culture inspired ice cream. We have Jack and Jill, Trouble Shuffle, Ice Ice Baby, Pink Floyd, Mint Condition, Southern Hospitality, and we have Smooth Operators. A bunch of famous people have come by here. Future's a fan, Joaquin Noah's a fan, Hillary Clinton's a fan. We have a lot of other fans out there as well. Good, good. Hi, fellas. Good, good. I still live two blocks from the store. Part of our job is to still be heavily in the community. And so if kids come in here with an A on their report card, we give them a free scoop of ice cream. It's to show them that we are the same as them. So I'm just a little older, but I'm still the same child at heart. And if you can find something that you like and you're passionate about, Go forth and just go for it, you know? Don't, don't not go for your dreams. Go for every last one that you have. You probably recognize these ice cream pellets as the ice cream of the future. They're Dippin' Dots, a summertime staple. But this confectionery treat didn't start as, well, ice cream. It started as cow feed. Dippin' Dots were invented in the 80s not by an ice cream brand, but by a microbiologist. 
Curtis Jones specialized in cryogenics. In 1987, he was working for a biotech company in Kentucky, trying to figure out how to make food for farm animals more efficient. His big breakthrough came when he flash froze cattle feed 350 degrees below zero, which produced small pellets. Serendipitously, Curtis loved making ice cream. Mm. Next thing he knew, he was using liquid nitrogen to freeze ice cream at extremely low temperatures and ended up with small beads of it. When eaten, the natural heat of the mouth melted the beads and thus, Dippin' Dots was born. A year later, he formed the company out of his parents' garage in Illinois. But there was a problem. Curtis had nowhere to sell the product. Dippin' Dots need to be stored at such a cold temperature that it made it impossible for grocery stores to house the tasty treat. So he got creative and marketed his product to alternate locations. Now they're sold at amusement parks, festivals, zoos, and other summertime destinations. But whether or not they really are the ice cream of the future, we'll just have to wait and see.